you're going to kill one in a thousand. You're the health professional. You know, your culture in the gym has to be, it, it, the culture that you have in the gym is really important. I mean, what's the goal? Is it just to make money or is it to help people? Because that's not really helping people. So Steve, going from uh, an episode on one side of the world to literally the other side of the world, now back in the UK. How are you finding it? Yeah, loving it, mate. Back in the UK, London, loving it. Back home. We are saying off air how much we, found, we both, when we went back recently, how we found it was such a creative place to be. Like I, I certainly, you were saying you were inspired. I was certainly felt inspired. What do you think it is about London that, that's different from other cities? Obviously, for me, it's the best city in the world, mate. It's busy, there's a vibe going on, you can eat at any time, go partying at any time. Not that I'm doing that. Um, it's just, I don't know, like, it's just, um, it's just, it's a very inspiring city, you know what I mean? Everyone's doing the grind, you know what mm. I mean? You've got, yeah, it's just, it's just the best, like, just non-stop, innit? I it's think, I think with, thing, you know? yeah, I think with London, it's, it's the intangible qualities that are, um, that, that make it like things I can't quite put my finger on because Hong Kong is like that. It's, it's, it's never sleeps, right? This attack on the senses. You can go out anytime, eat anytime. It's very similar in that regard, but it, there's a different feeling to London. And I think it's because if anyone in the UK wants to make big in their career in any industry, they go towards London. So you get all these people that are coming are either aspiring to be successful or are successful. Um, and in the city sort of built for that. Um, whereas like Hong Kong, you get that vibe you get us through travel and we haven't had travel for two and a half years. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel quite how it would normally feel, but I, I'll I tell you what, I'm, I'm very jealous of you being in London. I can't, I can't wait to come back again. It's funny. Cause I, I walk, I went down to Oxford street and Mayfair a few days ago. One of my mates just set up a gym in Mayfair, nice little boutique studio. And, um, I went in and he was working with a client finishing up anyway. Got spoke speaking to the client just friendly chat and then um then as he was leaving he said oh me and james are catching up on friday night if you want to come we're gonna smoke some cigars have some whiskey yet blah 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 you're more than welcome to come and i was like yeah 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 we'll see if i'm about and it just is nice you know what I mean? mm -hmm. so as much as my headspace when i left was like people don't have time for you in london because it's so busy and it's such a grind Maybe that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, I felt it's friendlier than I remember it. Where, where, where are you going for whiskeys? I don't know, but we were down in Mayfair, so I presume it's somewhere down there. His gym mm. is located right opposite the most, like the the most, the best shisha bar that you can get in London. It's like round Mayfair there, you know. Like he said, there's Lambos and Ferraris parked outside there every single night. <sighs> He's in a great spot. I used to remember when I used to do the walk to when we, because we used to, right? We used to walk to UP Mayfair to do the team meeting when City Boys yeah, had to go across. And I, I, I always used to think like, I, I would work so much harder if I worked in and around Mayfair. Because you come out and you see an Aston Martin every day. Like, you're going to pick, you're going to really work a little bit harder. You're going to push that your clients a little bit more. You're going to get on sales calls a little bit more just because you're just surrounded by such wealth. Like, I always remember the guys in London that followed gold cars around with cameras like these are like you know these like these gold-plated bentleys that people driving around there's like kids following them around with like cameras taking pictures like paparazzi it's like it's such a weird a weird place in that respect yeah it makes you think like there's there's um i mean there's a ton of wealth down there you know and mm. it's inspirational you know what i mean yeah i mean i asked you about where the whiskey place i remember going to a whiskey place in london called it was on uh paul street where we both used to work so remember that place? It was like it used to be a chip shop, but now like, yeah. down underneath there is a place yeah. called Black Rock. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it was like there's there's tiny, and they have two wooden lock like like locks like tree trunks, right? And they've carved them out and they put the house whiskey in there, put a glass bit on top to make it the table, and you've got a tap on the end where you can take the house have the house whiskey, and on the behind you, there's cabinets like on every wall of every bottle of whiskey you can imagine. And if you're a whiskey fan, like, like, you know, a sort of half Scottish bloke yeah. like me, it's, I'm a huge fan. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Scottish coming out in you, mate. Yeah, it doesn't come out in the accent, but it comes out in the whiskey and the skirts. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so moving on to the topic of, go on. Huh? Sorry. No, no, no. no what did you say? No, no, no. It's been good being back in London. Mm. 
So moving on to the topic of the day, we're closing out this series, gone through hypertrophy, we've gone through strength, and now let's move on to fat loss because it's something that 90% of coaches in this are going to get with their clients. Like That is the main goal. And 90% of people who want to get in shape start because they have some sort of fat loss goal. And training role in this fat loss part of the equation, everyone has a very different opinion of it. I actually think this might be the most interesting one of the three because it's very kind of set in stone. Everyone has the same ideas of how to train for strength. Everyone has the same fairly similar ideas of how to train for hypertrophy. But when it comes to fat loss, everyone has a different opinion. So when it comes to, let's say you've got a fat loss client, let's open up with the question of the day. What do you think is more important, nutrition, activity, or training in a fat loss phase, and why? Well, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a difficult question to ask, and I think my answer, I'll, I'll answer it in two different ways, yeah? My philosophy and my style of training, or sorry, my style of health and reaching goals is very training, program, structured, driven. So I'm always going to say training because that's what I provide to people at its highest level, etc. But the reality is I believe those three things need to be just as equal as each other to achieve the optimal fat loss result. Um, you know, if you're not sleeping, you're going to struggle. If you're not training smartly, you know, you're not going to optimize, you know, your fat loss efforts. But I, I would say, um, I hate to say it, but training is probably on the, on the, you know, that third one there. Hmm. I think nutrition and um, what was the other one? Activity. Moving. Activity are probably higher. So, um, but I wouldn't tell my clients yeah. that. <laughs> I, I, I always look at it yeah I mean I suppose there's, there's two arguments to this right like within our scope of practice people get scope of practice confused think that you can't even give any nutritional advice whatsoever but it's the thing that we have the most control over I, I, I got I, over a year ago I got um, Stefan Gazot on the show and he was he doesn't really delve much with nutrition he's very basic and Pat Davidson was the same and the reason why is because they're in complete control of the training so I don't know I, it's very hard to control what someone does in the other 23 hours of the day, but I am in control of this hour. So you can make that argument that is the most important because you are in most control of it. But yeah, the, but that's the, thing. the way I was that's, gone. But that's the thing, like, you know them as coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. that's their style, that's their philosophy, that's, that's, that's what they do. You know what I mean? If you spoke to someone who is more of a nutritionist, then they're going to say nutrition because that's what their expertise truly is, right? Mm. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's good to speak to someone like you because you're well-versed in all of them. So, you know, what, what do you think? I'd like, to, I'd like to think so. I always think of it like um, when I look at training nutrition activity, I, I would generally imagine it's like you've got like a stove and you've got a couple of gas burners and you can only have one massively burning really high, you've got to have a middle one, you've got to have one simmering on low heat. So they're all important, right? You've got to, you still want to cook three things. But when I look at strength and hypertrophy, training becomes such the focus. Like it is the biggest thing. Maybe you can maybe argue recovery comes in there with hypertrophy. But when I do check-ins with my clients looking to build muscle, it's really training focused. It's Let's look at your training videos. Let's look at your list. Let's look at how the volume's going. Let's look at a periodized program. Let's look at this in depth. When it comes to new, like fat loss phases, it's going to be nutrition being in a deficit number one. That's going to be the thing that's going to drive your weight loss. Activity to a degree is going to assist in that weight loss, but it's not as important as nutrition because activity also has that counter effect if you do too much of it it drives up appetite which makes nutrition harder to stick by and it's way easier to not eat 200 calories than burn it so mm-hmm. those two things have to be the top priority and really training i don't want to overwhelm clients especially most clients coming in a fat loss phase are probably relatively beginners so i don't want to overwhelm them just trying going over with everything training is there in my view in terms of and we'll talk about how we progress training as we get deeper into diets down the line Training, in my view, is there to not hold to hold on to as much muscle mass as possible, and not get them injured. That that is the sole purpose of it. So it becomes that small part, as long as you're doing it. But on the flip side of that, to play devil's advocate to my own argument, I do think 
that there's a psychological component to training that has a massive impact on fat loss. Even if it doesn't burn that many calories. I'm in the habit, if I've got a client three times a week, I will do three gym sessions and four cardio sessions. Now, that may seem like overkill to some people, but I'm doing it for a specific reason. That means every day you're doing something positive for your health. If you get up and go to the gym, you're probably going to have a more healthy lunch because you don't want to ruin the hard work you've done in the gym. If you're sat on the sofa with your feet up watching Netflix, you're more likely to grab a bag of Doritos. So training almost gives the drive and the motivation and the momentum to make the nutrition easier, which even though it may directly be the least important of the three, does raise importance slightly. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I can I see that you like what you're saying. Um, it's just helping them habit build, right? And and create a healthier lifestyle through habits and behaviors. And um, having a cardio day could simply mean hopping on a treadmill. For me, a cardio day could mean let's go for a nice long, fast, hilly walk for sixty mm. or ninety minutes, for example. Or a client has a swimming pool. Let's jump in the swimming pool for half an hour today and just go just swim um so yeah yeah around there weight training sessions yeah build those habits. you can tell you can tell you from perth where you, there's loads of real estate that you like if a client has a swimming pool in the house yeah, yeah i'm I, living in london and hong kong no clients ever had a swimming pool <laughs> yeah honestly like um a lot of my elderly pop you know i try i work with a lot of 60 plus and um a lot of them are you know retired and a lot of them have swimming pools so I get them twice a week jumping in the pool, whether that's walking mm. in the water for 20 minutes, half an hour, or, you know, breaststroking. That's what we do for a day or two of cardio work. And I, I love, I quite like pool work. I like pool work because it, the, the resistance is matched to your power. I remember doing an aqua aerobics class with a friend of mine a, few, a number of years ago when I worked at Virgin Active, okay. right? And you, it, the whole thing when you're a young lad, taking the mic, oh, it's just the old grannies doing aqua aerobics. That was one of the toughest classes I've ever done in my whole entire life. I will never judge these 80 year old deers ever again. Sorry, it's no. brutal. You ever done it? No, I don't intend to, to be honest. No, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. You will get schooled by 80 year olds. I promise you. <laughs> well, I, so I when think, it... um, I think uh, um, like that, you know, that's the good thing about working in a country that has beautiful weather, right? You, you know, you've got more access to um outdoor activities whether that's a jog a swim an ocean dip a cycle you know what i mean hmm. a, a walk along the coast for mindfulness you know there's so much more access to um doing things like that you know and you can't blame the cold the dark the weather there's, there's so this in, in hong kong it, it's such a weird discrepancy between the two because it is, it literally is like like a concrete jungle in the middle of an actual jungle. So like you get people that do like 30 odd thousand steps on a weekend because they go on all these incredible hikes and they will do less than 3000 steps Monday through Friday. Yeah. Like it's such a big wild thing that it's very hard to, to, to manage because it is such a tiny, small city. Um, but you, you mentioned that training is a big part of how you program. And obviously you must get clients to come to you for fat loss. So do you ever use training methods of training to increase a deficit with a client? One, and if so, one, do you think that makes an impact? And two, how do you approach increasing the deficit via training? I think, um, obviously if, if, you know, obviously if any coaches are listening and they want to increase the deficit through energy expenditure through exercise obviously it can be very hard to track and it may not be precise as we think and that's where people can get caught into thinking oh more sweat more work you know we're going to burn more calories etc create more of the deficit we know that you know when we are training, we're not really trying to do that as you mentioned earlier we're trying to in a fat loss phase uh, maintain some muscle mass okay we're trying to maintain muscle mass tissue so i don't try and create more of an energy deficit through training although we can sort of delve into that side if we want to increase output and we are making sure other areas are you know if their nutrition is on point they're doing enough steady state cardio 
if they're sleeping well and we just want to manipulate one thing then we may manipulate just the training density for example or push more training volume and it, there's obviously various ways to do that and um, I'll give you a way I may do that I may simply reduce the rest periods in the training session so you're you're essentially doing that by increasing density within the workout so the rest periods go down yeah. We should potentially have a bit of a cardiovascular benefit in itself with incomplete rest. Yeah. But with the aim here is that you may do, let's say you did three sets with 60 seconds rest. If you do 45 seconds rest, you get in the fourth set. So you actually do more work in the allotted time. Is that what you're looking to try and do? Yeah, or, or just keep the sets and the reps the same and just cut the rest period down session to session, week to week, for example, so that they're, they're having to work harder week to week hopefully still increasing load, but now the focus isn't maybe just on increasing load, it's decreasing rest period as we as we move through. Um, mm. I like to do that if we're doing a peripheral heart action style circuit where we go through various exercises, like in a circuit fashion, and we might start the week with uh, 90 second recoveries. And then the next session we do, we may go cut off 15 seconds, take 75 second recovery, then the following week, maybe, maybe down to 60, then 45, potentially 30 second rest periods. We're trying to create more of a hormonal um, cascade of stress and effects to, um, you know, create that energy expenditure. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, 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 makes, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I, I don't use density, like improving density in that sort of fashion very often. But I tell you what. One time where I probably would use it is if I'm doing a very specific dietary approach. If I'm taking somebody and doing a low to high dietary approach, if people don't know what I mean, it's starting more aggressive earlier on in the diet, which I quite like for real beginner clients because, one, they've got no structure to their diet anyway. So if I just give them macros and all these things to follow, it's really complicated. If I go, right, let's scale this back to the most things that are important. Hit a protein target, have lots of vegetables. So the calories are going to be quite low but they also can't train hard. They can't generate very much intensity. You start learning to train harder over the first few weeks. And then that's when I may increase density, increase the training volume as the food goes up with it. So it's, yeah. it's almost the deficit stays the same, but I'm just fueling the training as they get better at training. Um, that's when I would potentially use density in, in my workouts. The only other time I use density is actually a deload from strength work. So, we mentioned in the strength program that I was talking about escalating density training. And I, I deliberately said, I'm not going to mention it because we're going to mention it in another episode. Um, it's not technically what I do for fat loss, but for anyone who doesn't know what EDT style training is when let's say you did, I don't know, um, six deadlifts, six incline dumbbell press. You put 20 minutes on the clock. You do as many rounds as possible. The actual weight is going to be considerably less, but you accumulate a lot of volume through tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of sets. Well, I quite like that more as a deload through strength training. Um, as like a, when their 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 nervous systems are a bit fried, or they're just freaking themselves out with the heavy loads, just get them used to just picking shit up and not thinking about it. Yep. Yeah, Do you use it much? That. EDT. Um, I I have in the past. I haven't I haven't used it for a few years now. Um, hmm. I think some clients respond really well to it. To it, they really enjoy it, and some clients um really dislike <clears> it because it's very monotonous just working for 20 minutes on two exercises for example doing the same thing back and forward i find that some people do just keep looking at the clock or um you know they want to know a target you know with their sets and when they're six sets away still they get a bit down and you know i mean it's it's hard to you know you have to be um a certain type of psych to do those sort of edt workouts i think Hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I totally agree. Do you think there's gender differences here when it comes to using more volume as you go through a fat loss phase or more density? Do you think women would handle it better than guys? Yeah, I certainly think so. I think, um, I mean, as we know, like females can tend to tolerate more volume, more work, less rest periods, right? Um, and that's simply hmm. because, partly because they, they have less fast twitch muscle fibers than the males so you know their ability to replenish energy is better and um, use oxygen better um, than males so is it, is it specifically fast twitch is it specifically fast twitch or is it more muscle mass overall right because if there's more muscle mass overall there's potentially more and, fatigue yeah, the bit harder course, the heart rate's going to work yeah. yeah i think it's a combination yeah i mean um, 
you know, more more muscle mass overall for a male and uh, more more fast twitch fibers overall for a male and um, you know overall less less um, weights heavy loads for a female it's less taxing um, hmm. yeah all those factors you know what I mean and then yeah yeah I think I think that's what helps them do more work right hmm. would you if, because I, I know you're a big fan like like me of, of not just writing program to program right you write blocks you write 12 20 weeks ahead of time right so when you're looking at periodizing somebody who's got a fat loss goal in mind let's say you're doing a 20 week block would you periodize density over the course of that 20 weeks or is it not something you would look at um i don't tend to look at it too much um for my fat loss clients i have an idea of where i want to go with it i want to drive more volume and i want them to work really hard and depending on their age and their injuries and training experience i will choose the method accordingly you know so if i have someone who's young ready to go work really hard has minimal stress i may use a lot of sort of difficult intermediate to advanced training methods and intensifiers with them straight in and make them really really harder and harder as we go sort of in a linear fashion just drive the volume um, as we go Hmm. and um with someone who's a bit older, injuries, etc., I'll take a slower, more passive approach with it, more conservative approach with it, and maybe not use any of those. I might use those sort of difficult methods once every, you know, four, five, six weeks. Hmm. When it comes to like periodizing a block, let's go back to the example of a 20 week fat loss block. So if you're not using particularly density, you mentioned volume being the main thing you're looking to drive up over the course of that training block. Is there any other things you look to change? Do you progress exercise into bigger, more compound lifts as you go through the block? Um, obviously, it depends on what they can do and what their structure is. But what kind of things are you looking at in terms of progression during a fat loss block? Because the yes. obviously the progression you're looking for is like body weight on the scale and like things like this. But they're not training related outcomes. So what are the training related outcomes you're looking for? One of the um, I mean, like if I think practically, one of the things I try and drive over a say a ten. 16 20 week block is the progression of a step up i try and drive that whether that's high or low i think a step up is a great exercise for anyone and for people that are working on fat loss it's very very taxing because if you do a low block step up they can use a fairly heavy weight and a heavy load and if you're using a high step up they use less load and a larger range of motion so both strategies are very taxing for the individual along with it being single leg now if you put that early on in the workout they'll you know maximize load they'll maximize technique and ability if you put it in the middle or at the back end of the workout then you know um you know you're going to challenge them in a different way right under fatigue i think a step up's a great exercise to work with there's so many variations of it i tend to stick with a front step up um, like a forward step up, but mm. there's side step ups. There's sort of these step ups where you drive the opposite knee. You can alternate the step up, which is very taxing for fat loss as well, where you just alternate in the leg that you step up and step down on. Um, barbell on the back, barbell to the front, dumbbells on each side, contralateral, cable step. I know it's a slight table. tangent, but why why would you choose? Let's say position first, because obviously loads a different conversation entirely. But why would you choose? Front step up, side step up, Russian step up, um, alternating. Like, what is your purpose and thought process behind choosing them, and why do you prefer the front step up normally? I prefer the front step up because it's the the most simplest, and it's the most it's the most variable one that we can use. Um, if someone has a bad knee, we can adjust the distance that we step to the block. For example, we can increase the angle of the knee. For example. If someone is, um, you know, if someone has a dodgy back, we can manipulate the angle of the step up. We can even elevate the hill a little bit and load up the quad a little bit more. Um, I like the front step up because it's an easy start with a lot of variations. And it's very simple. Everyone goes up and down stairs every day, right? They know how yeah. to do that. So whether we're holding on to something or we're not, that's the, that's the first step up I use. Hmm. So, and then you would, in terms of um, how high the step goes, when would you go low step up? When would you go high step up and why? 
Yeah, so like I might actually, a lot of times, if I'm training someone twice a week, a lot of times I'll have a low step up in the um, first workout towards the back end of the program where we're using heavy loads under fatigue. And in the second workout of the week, I may have a higher step up variation, which will tax a little bit more of the hip um, extensors. And um, that will be, you know, early on in the workout, for example. That's how I like to program those. But I mean, that's not set in stone. They may vary depending on um, injuries, etc. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I say front step up, but that could be a step down from a from a small step as well. You know, just to target, you know, uh, muscles that help contribute to stability through the knee. Hmm. You know, um, so yeah, that's, so that's how I sometimes program that. So going back to the program for fat loss over the course of this block. You mentioned there about volume being something you look to drive up over time. And obviously with more advanced clients, you really look to try and push that a little bit quicker. Do you feel that there is it always, is more volume always the goal with fat loss or is there a time and a place where less volume you think is necessary? Like actually taking a step back from training volume? Yeah, certainly, yeah. Um, when we're dealing with individuals who are, you know, stressed out, you know, mother of two, three kids, um, anyone with high blood pressure, elderly population, anyone that doesn't sleep, anyone that doesn't have good control over their blood pressure, cardiovascular health, um, lots of medication, that sort of stuff, then the driver will not be volume. The driver yeah. may be um, sort of cardiovascular um, benefits more so, um, less sort of complex contraction methods, less eccentric loading. Um, more sort of concentric base loading we may get the sled out more um, sled drags for long periods of time circuits with minimal eccentric and isometric loading less overhead pressing less pull downs that sort of stuff mm. and then the progression would normally be just to um, you know manipulate the exercise choice so why why not overhead pressing and pull downs well what I found with some of my clients is that when we use those exercises, um, it's a lot more taxing for their cardiovascular system. Heart rate shoots up very fast, and that's not something that we want to drive if we're, you know, working, you know, cardiovascular issues. Okay, that makes that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I asked that question because it's like I, I always used to be very much someone that would drive volume over a course of a phase. Whereas now I will try volume to a point because I think as we get deeper, especially when people are getting really lean and as we get deeper into a fat loss target, recovery becomes more and more important. And the training becomes, as you said, I think training is more important in a fat loss phase earlier than later. In the early stage when food's still relatively high and you've not been in the diet that long, you can do a lot more with training. But in the, in the end phases where calories are maybe a little bit lower, carbohydrates are going to be a bit lower to fuel things. You're probably going to get some down regulation in testosterone, thyroid, like, like not huge if you do it right, but there's going to be some that my goal here is I don't want to tank them, tank the recovery even more. So quite often I will start like a phase one where let's say I'm doing three sets or something. Then I will literally progress probably volume and intensity and do like four sets of 10 rather than three sets of 12. But then I probably will then increase the intensity further. But instead of going to five sets, I would do like literally three sets of six. And that set I took away on the big lifts, I put into smaller muscle groups, things that's not going to tax them as much. So like I might do five sets of shoulders and arms and only like two to three sets of like heavy stuff. And I found like sometimes when you certainly when you get people coming towards the end of a diet, they end up looking a little bit softer and depleted just because they get a bit inflamed and maybe start. They haven't got enough ability to recover with their nutrition as much. And just taking that step back sometimes allows them to feel better, look better and not drive appetite too high, which yeah. I, it's the important thing at the end of the diet. I just want to let the nutrition do its work. My job is to get in, maintain muscle mass by just lifting heavy and get out. Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a is good that something you utilize people? I think that's a good point that like, I think a lot of people do drive um, volume incorrectly and it's, um, it has bad consequences. Um, like, you know, like this is the thing though. So si, like, I say drive volume, but you know, my, my moderate to high volume is, is, is you know like my background is a lot of strength stuff so you know what i deem moderate to higher volume is probably way less than what you would deem it to be um mm. you know what i mean like i if i have fat loss clients in that are 
advanced, intermediate to advanced, their average rep over 12 weeks may only be six to eight. Mm. So when I drive volume, I might push them to 12 to 15. I might not do sets of 50 and, you know, 18 sets on the lower body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I suppose as well, you also got to think about the, the, the intensity that someone's willing to train at as well, or are able to train at. Because for sake of all, and but like, I'm not saying either one of these is, is, is better or worse when it comes to volume considerations, but someone who's new to the gym and bounce a lot of weight up, they won't get a lot of local fatigue, right? So they maybe can drive more volume in terms of more sets, maybe with the argument that you're not actually taxing the muscle as much of each individual set. That being said, they're going to drive up more systemic fatigue. So their nervous system may be a little bit more fatigued. They may get a lot of junk volume. Um, so maybe they won't recover as well. And then vice versa. You know, you could say that the person might not get a lot of systemic fatigue because they're so dialed in, they're more advanced sort of bodybuilder, but they could absolutely trash the muscles and just not have the fuel to recover. So I think it, it, a really important skill as a coach is to be able to know, right, what is the signs of I'm overtraining from a muscular standpoint, which I'll be looking at things like tendonitis, they're sore for multiple days on end, and what's my signs that I'm overtaxing it from a nervous system perspective? General lethargy, sleep issues, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's a good point. I think recovery is probably the most important thing that we need to track um, to guide our training um, systems. You almost try to look for what is the most the most you can do without actually going over that limit. And obviously, as the resources come down, that ceiling has to come down with it. When it comes to conditioning, this is something where you have a much better understanding and comprehension of energy systems and conditioning than I do. Um, from a fat loss perspective first, but maybe we, if you wanted to go generally over conditioning and the basics of energy systems, how are you sort of approaching this? Do you favor steady state um, over high intensity? Do you go more high intensity? You know, What's the importance of having an aerobic base? Just run me through a little bit your ethos towards conditioning. Yeah, I think... You know, when it comes, there's def, you know, there's different ways to condition people, and depending on the goal. But first and foremost, depending on their physiological state that they're currently at. I worked with old people, for example, and some of them are doing real high intensity stuff. Surprise, surprise, mm. and a lot of the young ones aren't doing high intensity stuff. Surprise, surprise, but over time those youngsters will eventually do that harder work stuff once they gain control over their stress management, their training um, ability, you know, once they're training properly, and once they're at a level of strength that I feel is good enough and movement quality is good enough, then we'll start introducing harder sort of methods for conditioning. Why, why is it dependent on the level of strength they have? Why do you push the conditioning more when they get to a level of strength? Because when you're trying to do high intensity sort of efforts, if you're not capable of producing force, power, and ap applying that into, say, an air dine sprint or a rowing sprint, you know, if you're going to do a, a Tabata, a proper high intensity session, you need to be able to apply that force and power and make it maximal. All right, the problem is people don't know how to produce that maximal effort. So they're not working at high intensity. They're working at like a moderate intensity, mm. which is no wonder why they can do repetitive work of it and rest really low and feel ready to go. When you do proper high intensity work, like a Tabata at a proper high intensity, you're not walking out of the gym, you're crawling. If you do it properly, if you do a proper wind gate, for example, on a Wingate bike, you're done for. The problem is people aren't strong enough and capable of producing power and force because they're just not strong on a, on a squat and a deadlift and, a, you know, those movement patterns, you know, they, they, they can't produce power and reap the rewards of proper high-intensity training. This is why I like air bikes and air dines because it teaches people how to have a fast concentric turnover at quick pace. Mm. And you can use the wattage to measure power and show the individual, oh, look, you're averaging 400 watts in that 10 seconds. But your peak power is only 410, 420. It should be way higher. 
mm. right? Your peak should be way higher. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's why tracking numbers is important as well. Um, generally, people with cardiovascular issues, high blood pressure, etc., we I tend to just do more steady state sort of methods. Yeah, that, that, and that, I, think that, I think that's a really important point. But just going back onto the generate intensity, I, it's amazing. You'll see people early on. I remember in, when where we used to work, like conditioning was always the last five minutes of a training program, right? And you get people off that Wingate bike and they'll be like, cool, what's next? I'm like, hold on. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's not how this works. And it's, it's a skill to, to be able to sort of generate that level of intensity that is, that is necessary. Um, and also, like, not only is it a skill to generate that much intensity, you've also got to be able to have a decent level of ability to buffer lactate. So when you're going, maybe not so much on a Tabata, which is mega, mega short, when you start going on to start longer bouts of high intensity work, if your quads are the thing that gives way, rather than actually taxing the cardiovascular system at any point, then you need to be doing more steady state first because you're just not buffering lactate anywhere near the ability. Some higher volume blocks, uh, more strength and jaw and stuff, more steady state cardio, proving your aerobic work is necessary. Otherwise, yeah, it will be hard, but not you're not actually reaping the benefits that we want. Yeah, and, and that's a good point as well. Um, that Which is, again, why I like to use air dines and dead mill sprints and that sort of stuff, because you can take... You, you can easily get people to that level when there's a fast concentric turnover, you know, minimal eccentric effort, mm. um, sled, backward sled drags, stuff like that. They're really effective for driving those sort of high intensity protocols with beginners. Um, well, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, um, it's an ease over toes guy. It's an ease over toes guy favorite, isn't it? Reverse sled drags. Yeah, yeah. But he, I mean, he uses it for rehab purposes and to drive blood flow around the knees, etc. Um, so it's great for that, you know, it's a good option. Um, but again, you know, I, I've, you know, fat loss phases or not, I've used cardiovascular work at the beginning of training sessions as well. Mm. And why would you do that? What would be the purpose of um, using it at the beginning rather than the end of a session? Well, sometimes when you're working with clients, they have they've trained for a long time but they're just too they're still weak they're still weak so and they've got bad habits so i like to use you know three to six minutes of rowing or cardiovascular work to really fatigue them and expose them to jelly legs and then mm. we'll apply some technical weightlifting. now they might only do body weight split squats but i might manipulate the time that they spend under under tension with specific pauses in certain positions and um, they build better skill and technique under fatigue um, they've already trained the cardiovascular system Interesting. and um, they might hang out in you know so for, i'll give you a quick example so once i do an assessment with someone let's say they have tight hips right tight quads tight hips like most people do um I spend a couple of minutes doing, you know, reverse sled drags or bike work, fatigue their legs for five minutes. Then I might put them on a front foot elevated split squat and do body weight, three sets of six reps with a three second count on the way down and a three to five second pause in the bottom stretch mm -hmm. position. So I might do that, expose them to low reps, but a long time under tension with a three to five second pause in that bottom position. Now it sounds easy. Sounds easy, but it's certainly difficult one, because they've done that cardiovascular work and they're taking long pauses on the split squat. So that's a simple way to manipulate all different variables and get mm. a benefit that you can advance from next time. And how would I progress that? Then I might pull the split squat out and introduce a squat, like a squatting, like elevate the heels and squat and do the same sort of tempos and then add the split squats after with the same tempos. That's how I may progress a session where someone needs to work on mobility the goal is fat loss at the same time and they need to improve the cardiovascular health that's, that's interesting training block. that's really interesting that's something i've never ever played around with in terms of conditioning at the start and I'll, I'll speak on my thoughts of cardio through a fat loss phase at the moment not coming from it with a 
a strength coach and performance coach mentality and just come from purely from a fat loss general pop perspective. But I know everyone has, I've always looked at something, something like that beforehand will fatigue you and potentially put you at higher risk of injury. But then it's just monitoring those things, playing around with tempos rather than loads. And in argument, you could potentially, if you make your exercise selection right, you can make it safer because you don't actually need to get the same level of load to create a hypertrophy response because you're coming into it from a fatigue standpoint. Very similar to how um, when Luke Lehman programs the backloaded structural balance work where he may do like PNF couch stretches into split squats, then go like incline hyper into, uh, I don't know, whatever leg exercise he wants and finish off with a back squat. Same, same sort of approach, but you're doing using the cardiovascular system rather than the loaded, yeah. loaded stretching as a way of doing this. Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. And that, that's a method that I always use with my 60 plus population or anyone with cardiovascular issues. Always drive <laughs> cardiovascular adaptation first and then we move into our weight training. When it comes, because a lot of the stuff we've talked about so far with conditioning wise has all been relatively high intensity conditioning, right? It's always been hit and high intensity modalities. Do you prefer when it comes to fat loss? Because you could make an argument that actually these conditioning, these high intensity conditioning modalities actually work best not in the dieting phase because you can have the carbohydrates to fuel them, right? When it comes to fat loss phases, there is a lot of argument people saying that HIT is better, some people say that steady state's better. Where do you hang your hat in terms of the, your preferred cardio modality during a fat loss program? Quite simply, on training days, I like to drive more moderate to high intensity conditioning methods if they are capable and like we said are able to and on rest days i like to drive more of the steady state cardio work hmm. because it helps with their recovery and restoration and to have a little bit more of an output of energy expenditure hmm. that's basically how i like to do it but again that's not set in stone that will change for different people hmm. that makes that makes a lot of sense as well i suppose as well if you in a training you want to almost drive a stress environment right where they create a stimulus where as soon as someone finishes training you want to put them back in a parasympathetic more relaxed state doing some steady state cardio on those rest days could actually help them do that get them out of the head and have a good mental benefit which improves recovery even more um and then you say use the training when you're with them to to drive the level of intensity would that would you potentially then as someone got deeper into a fat loss phase phase out the high intensity conditioning in the same way we talked about maybe bringing volume down as someone got deeper into a diet or do you not see not do you not feel it has that much of an effect um i may do if um if they're struggling to recover or sometimes i may in, or i may just bring the frequency down and maybe introduce like a high and a low day so on a monday they do a very central nervous system um driven session uh, like conditioning session you know, they might do a couple of, you know, they might do two, three sets of, you know, short max effort sprints with long rest periods. On a Tuesday, they might do something a bit more lactate based, 250 meter rows with, you know, moderate rest recoveries, like maybe a one to two, one to three work to rest ratio. And then on a Wednesday, some form of steady state work where they work for longer and to keep their heart rate at lower intensities. So I might have those three different days high low and then a and then a lower recovery day and just have those over six days with a sunday rest day mm. if they're more intermediate to advanced when it comes to sort of like having someone you're saying if they can handle it and how well the recovery is and that's what guides you do you other than just subjective measures are you looking at metrics in terms of um how you judge this because you can make an argument here that guys for sake of argument are probably going to be more come to you more weight training focused probably do things under eight reps, uh, probably going to be more stressed, probably going to move less because they're just into strength training and lifting as heavy as possible when they come to you. So you might find more instances of higher blood pressure. You might find more instances of low HRV. And would you then drive more aerobic style modalities as opposed to maybe a girl that's been on the cardio machines for three, four years before coming to you and barely touched a weight room? You might want to drive more high intensity stuff to bring them back into the middle. Do you think about that sort of stuff or not? Um, at times, yeah. I mean, it's always important to think about the individual's health, right? And um, prioritize their health so that they maximize, you know, you know their result. Um, but, you know, with the males that come in looking for weight training, if they're not ready for it, 
I'll just I'll, I'll keep it in there. I'll keep the weight training in there and just make sure they prioritize those extra days where they have to do steady state work or prioritize their sleep or prioritize their nutrition even more or prioritize their stress management to allow them to get those four or five weight training sessions in. Um, so it's not always the case of changing um, what they're doing because, you know, we've got to get buy-in and we've got to keep the client happy, right? Hmm. Um, although there are some people that, you, you know, you know, some females may come in and want to sweat and work hard and do high intensity sort of base methods. Um, and, and sometimes they just don't want it, you know what I mean? So it's just, you know, they're not ready to change. So that that's fine. We can't help everyone. Hmm. I'm um when, when it comes to my methodologies around cardio and in, enjoying fat loss phase, especially with general population clients who probably don't sleep well and stressed and all these other things, I... I tend to move away. And this is why I said at the start that, you know, you probably are much more experienced at the conditioning side of stuff than me from a lot of high intensity work. And this is generally for a number of reasons. One is that if they're going into a lower carb diet, not necessarily a low carb diet, but lower carb diet, am I really fueling this training session that I need to do? Also, if our goal is to maintain muscle mass, we're not really lighting the world on fire with performance improvements, maybe other than like a few little beginner changes, then do I want to make sure I, my time is spent in that gym doing the things that are going to be the biggest bang for the buck for them and hold on to as much tissue as possible. But the biggest one for me when it comes to fat loss during a, uh, sorry, conditioning during a fat loss phase is for every bit of improvement that you might get from a lot of this cardio work in terms of potentially improved cardiovascular health, improved conditioning, all that sort of stuff. We can talk mitochondrial health, that's slightly different. It's, you're always playing with fire because you are going to ramp up appetite through the roof. And this is why I think it was really important to have that this conversation because it's like, all right, which one is the most important? Nutrition is the thing that drives your fat loss. And if now that's so much harder to stick to because I've started doing tons of high intensity interval training work with you, we're going to be fighting a real uphill battle. And this is why I generally prefer steady state. It's easy for the client to do. And you can do it on their own without any risk of injury. It doesn't drive up that much um, of an appetite. And proving an aerobic base will improve mitochondrial health, which will improve energy out part of the equation. It'll improve conditioning, albeit gradually. Um, and it'll improve all sorts of health stuff as well. And it's just, it's very, very simple. And, I, and people say one of the biggest complaints about cardio is that it's boring. And while steady state's cardio is more boring, at least you can listen to a podcast doing it which I can't, doing sets of hill sprints. Yeah, I, I certainly think, um, like, if you give someone a proper structured strength training program, I think the steady state cardio is almost like, you know, a, you know how I think of it when I do it. I think, man, this is a relief. This is easy. <laughs> I get away from this hard work. I can just listen to some music now because I can concentrate on listening to music. You know what I mean? Like they can get away from the hard work and just just tick over and be a bit more mindful and walk and you know what I mean. Um, mm. So I, I'm not a massive driver of high intensity work. I also yet. think no, I'm not. Go on, sorry. No, that's what I was just saying. I'm not a massive driver of high intensity work. I think, I think, not that it's overrated. I just think that most people aren't ready to do it. Yeah. No, I I I couldn't agree more. And you mentioned that important for fat loss. You know. It, especially when you're you're saying about getting away from the hard work in the gym, but I also think getting away from the hard work in life. Sometimes when I get into a dieting phase, I'm getting into the routine of, of doing cardio regularly, like steady state cardio. I really enjoy it because if I'm sat, if I sat down to do work or study, quite often I'll find this. Uh, my brain will find something. ADHD doesn't help, but I'll, I'll find something else to do. I feel guilty because I'm not doing this. I'm I'm watching a doing some study, but I'm sitting there going, "Well, it's actually not." helping my business directly maybe i should message this person maybe i should do this and you never really properly switch off but the beauty of being on a treadmill is that when you're on a treadmill and like you you can't really do much that stuff you can't do the the deep work so it forces you then to go in and listen to a podcast watch some educational videos and be generally present in it and get out of work mode i like going for a, like a walk down the front or getting on a piece of cardio equipment for that exact reason it's a mental break and just, just a quick one while I'm, you know, like, uh, when I was the strongest I've been, 
and physically looking the best I've looked, my cardiovascular health was very, very poor. Uh, I would struggle to go upstairs and I was just doing high intensity sprints and air dying sprints and all that like hard work. I looked incredible and I was really strong and powerful, but I was by no means healthy. Why do you think that was? I just think like, you know, a, a lot of it was stress related. You know, I was doing essays for my masters. I was moving home and I wasn't sleeping because I was averaging five and a half, five hours sleep every night because I was up at maybe 4.15 every morning for work and getting home late for work. So it's not the training that I should have been doing because I just wasn't recovered. And I was young enough to do that for 9, 12, 16, 20 weeks, mm. half a year, whatever it was, and get away with it. But, you know, when I had to run upstairs or chase the bus, I started to realise, like, what am I doing this for? I need to be healthy. I got I'd do in the tricep dip and then I would get like dizzy and lightheaded. I would get heart palpitations. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's not healthy. So we had a client in the gym once who <clears throat> was weight training and um, he was going through a divorce. Kid involved. He wasn't my client. And uh, he would come in on a Saturday morning stinking of alcohol sometimes. And the coaches, the other trainers would say, yeah, just beasting, beasting. And uh, I'm like, fucking hell, this guy needs a glass of red wine and I have a hot bath, a bubble bath, not fucking. And then he was coming in 5 a.m. in the mornings to do weight training. Then he would come back later in the evening to do high intensity sprints and the air dying and all that sort of shit. And the coaches would make him do that then one morning he came in he jumped on the rower to warm up and then he had chest pains he went to the hospital and they said listen you've had a stroke then he didn't train for the next I don't know 12 24 months I mean what's the chances of that happening it may be rare it may be slim but there you go you're gonna kill one in a thousand you're the health professional. Yeah. So it just yeah. goes to show you that, that, you know, stress and training and style, just training method is very important. And coaches need to, that's why I love Luke Lehman, muscle nerd stuff, you know, beast mode, least mode, this sort of stuff. But, you know, your culture in the gym has to be, the culture that you have in the gym is really important. Mm. The culture that we had at the previous gym I worked at was just, all guys training, hard work. Everyone had to do hard work. All these chicks are doing, you know, you know, um, twenty five calories as hard as they can on the air bike. Who can get the quickest time? But the whole, all hundreds and hundreds of members doing it. I mean, why? Mm. It creates community. It creates banter. It creates competitiveness, which drives a lot of success in the gym. Hell yeah. But ultimately, I mean, what's the goal? Is it just to make money? Or is it to help people? Because that's not really helping people. Hmm. You know, I'm working with clients now that have a lot of psychological issues and problems from training that way with other people. So they're all over the place. So I'm, I'm just like a fucking, uh, you know what I mean? I'm just like fucking counsellor half the time. Yeah, so I think that's, that's, it's important people, as well. They're not helping anyone. Hmm. So that's what a lot of gyms and coaches are like. It's, and it's not just it, it's that story is is, is 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 really sad really and it's not just what they made him do it's not just to start a train it's the problem it's the mentality of if someone's not followed the diet or if someone's gone out on the lash or someone's got less sleep you beast them it's a punishment mentality which doesn't create a good vibe and relationship personal relationship with you and your client but at worst could have layered on the stress we're creating training stress and we're creating emotional stress for the client because we are making them feel bad and negative every time they do something that they're doing to probably unwind and de-stress from the world. And while there has to be a level of accountability, especially if there's goals set, you've got to be smart about it. If someone's coming in after a long flight or someone's coming in after three hours sleep, knowing how to adjust the program on a fly to work around that client, maybe bring the overall volume down, maybe doing things that aren't going to affect the nervous system as much. This stuff is important because that is personal in personal training. 
But this is the problem now, though, isn't it? You, you've got people that are setting gyms up and, um, you know, through COVID or whatever, like, they they they, they got to make money. And these people are making money, making their clients come in. Like, I tell you what, now, when my clients, you know, if one or two of my clients text me on a Sunday night and they're training on a Monday morning and say, oh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not sleeping well. I didn't sleep well for the last 24, 48 hours. Um, my husband's away. Um, I'm trying to manage the kids. I got my I got my long run in the morning because I'm prepping for a marathon. Um, whatever. I'll be like, listen, cool man. I'll see you Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll sort it out. Just take the day off. <laughs> like I'm like that because I'm not I'm not focused on like just uh, getting the clients in and make, taking the money. I'm pr- trying to prioritize their health, and I do that so that I can, like you know, get them fresh and ready to go. Um, whereas gyms are just like you know you got to come in, come on, you got to toughen up. There's a time and a place to toughen up and do work. When it's pushed too much, that's where people run into health issues and health complications. And even not just to health, right? Like, yeah, okay, calorie deficit. It's 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 hammered into the ground. You need a calorie deficit to lose weight, and it's irrefutably right. But people don't people don't underestimate from a fat loss perspective the calories out part of the equation. They literally are, most trainers are so simplistic of eat less, move more. Now, while that is the overarching principle here. If from that perspective, if someone's chronically stressed, under recovered, and then you're going in and you're smashing them and you're making them feel guilty and you're making them feel bad. When we train, we're driving up a sort of breakdown, a catabolic response, right? If you want to build some tissue, you at some point have to chill the fuck out to allow you to actually be in a position where you're going to grow and going to recover. If you're chronically in that state, that's going to have all sorts of issues down the line, health and just shitty results and this is why you see people all the time yeah they got into a calorie deficit yeah they lost the weight lost some weight but they look like an emaciated marathon runner mm. not an athlete because they're, they're burning through tissue like there's no tomorrow mm, mm. and um and then they look worse again in another 12 weeks because they've got considerably less muscle mass and they started eating because he gave them this, this stressful diet and the feeling guilty that they were so terrible every time they went out for a beer yeah, and this is where, you know, it, it sells, isn't it, though? You know what I mean? It looks sexy when people get shredded and look like that and go through those extreme training systems, that regardless of their stress levels and their lifestyle factors. Um, and they get into, in, like, lean, incredible shape. But we know that's not the definition of health, right? I'd rather see someone drop half the body fat and um, sleep better and be more positive and a better outlook on life than just getting shredded and um, feeling depressed. Mm. I'd, I'd also like to think as well, if anyone that follows follows me on social media, I'd like to think over the years, I've seen a number of results that I've posted where I haven't had to do this with clients. And I would argue if you actually spent some time learning a little bit about what's going on in terms of recovery and what's going on under the hood, you can get just as good, if not better results with a much better approach. Um, and it might not be necessarily like the four week fat loss diet, but they still could be quite quick. He still could be looking at 10, 12, 20 weeks to get an incredible transformation done the right way. But I think people, I love the fact that we are starting to simplify more complex topics. We're not going deep into hormones and endocrinology with every personal trainer. It's just not necessary as overkill. But on the flip side of this, I think we're on the verge of maybe going too far, oversimplifying it to a point where trainers don't actually learn anything other than um, let's go 10 calories per pound and let's do tons of cardio and just increase volume yeah. forever until until shredded, rinse and repeat until broken. Um, yeah, and I think it's more nuanced. Yeah, I think like, um, and, you know, it doesn't help when, you know, everyone has a voice and a platform to talk about these things right because you get you know beginner trainers coaches inexperienced trainers and coaches talking about calorie deficits and about training and about programming and it it just um yes like you said it's important but a proper coach knows how to apply it and um, that's the art of coaching, right? How you apply it, how you um, put all these things into practice and take the person that is there and, um, you know, choose the diet, choose the strategy, 
choose how you're mm. going to build those habits and behaviors up and um, build a proper program. Do you think the rise of weight, the way online training is going is actually making this pro process worse as well? Because no, I'm not here to, sl to slag off online training. Right? We both do some online training. And I do think it has a great ability with really good coaches to allow great coaches to have more influence and help more people all across the world. We, 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 we've bigged up Luke Lehman in this show, right? Luke Lehman now, I in Hong Kong, if I wanted to, could pay and train with Luke Lehman. That's only going to improve my knowledge. It's only going to improve my health. But for every person like a Luke Lehman or an us or a Pat Davidson or someone else is doing online training and looking after their clients, you have someone who now has not even done a single session on the gym floor, never gone through a diet, doesn't understand recovery because they've never, ever, ever got to a diet and gone. They just see on paper, you should be fine because the textbook says to me, this isn't that low calories. I'm like, yeah, but everyone's individual. They don't see the nuance because they've never been there. They can't relate. They can't empathize. And they've never gone through these training methods. They see a training, they see 6, 12, 25 and go, oh, that's a good program because this guy does it or GVT because I saw Joe Wicks has it in his books and he's never gone to a GVT program. This is the thing, right? I, I watch, I follow people and I watch them online and um, coaches, online coaches. And um, the information they say is, is basic and it's correct. But you can just always tell that they, they they don't know how to work with people. They're not a coach. They're not a personal trainer. Don't call yourself a personal trainer or a strength coach. You're not working with people. You can tell, you know. Um, I, I met a young guy yesterday, 19-year-old boy. He's just qualified. And um, he's trying to get work in a gym, etc. And he said, oh, I'm going to start, you know, looking for a gym job. And um, Monday, Tuesdays, I'm going to try and build some online clients up and stuff like that. And I said, oh, I think you should just keep driving one-to-ones, you know, and just become better. Find yourself a coach, train with people, work with clients on a one-to-one -one basis. I said, don't worry about all that online stuff. It's just noise. Um, and he said, yeah, but, you know, it's easy and it's good money. And I said, yeah, but you're competing against people like me. And then he thought about it and he was like, oh, yeah. You know, you know I mean? like, yeah, you know, what I mean, like there's levels to this. And, um, you know, he's better off doing his thing, working in a gym, getting, creating, like crafting his, his skill and becoming very good at it. And then dabbling in the online space, I think. Could, I couldn't agree more. You know, who am I to say that? You know what I mean? If he wants to just make money, then go for it. But yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, when it comes to um, that and like people skipping the gym floor, at least he's wanting to do a gym floor job. So many people go straight into the online market because they go, uh, and you ask them why they want to go online because I, I can work from the beach. I can work in Bali. And I'm like, one, you'll never work on the beach, right? The Wi-Fi is never good on the beach and it's rubbish. So like you will work in an office, right? And you, if you probably started PTing because you want to get out of an office job. But like, I'm sat in these four little walls quite a lot of my day for this that, that very reason so but people skip it and i also think as well one thing he said that i, I, I took note of is people go oh well it's easy like it's not easy but online training is a different skill set to one-to-one -one, and it's a challenging skill set and you still have to manage people manage people's emotions manage people's free cards manage people's ups and downs and we mentioned earlier on at the start of this show right podcasts come in full circle we both love london because it's a creative people for creative people and we said everybody who wants to be successful in an industry goes and lives in London, right? Yet we're now seeing a bunch of personal trainers that want to be successful personal trainers and don't want to work in a gym at all. It's a weird thing. You wouldn't go, I want to be a good lawyer. Where do you want to work? Bali. No, you'd, you'd go and work in a law firm for a little while. Mm. Like you'd earn your stripes. And I just think that's being lost in this fitness industry because people have this very wrong illusion that it's easy money. And it's only easy money if you're willing to, if you have a massive audience and you're willing to compromise on your values, if you want to give a good quality service and you want to look after people's health and you don't want to just make money and have those million clients where the one of them is that kid that has the stroke, then it's going to be hard. You're going to work longer than you think. And, and whether you do it one-to-one -one or online, it's exactly the same world. Certainly, yeah. I actually think online is a lot harder, you know, the time, effort that you have to put into it if you're going to do it properly. Um, and and you've got to be present always. So hmm. you've also got to you've also got to be as you said you've got to be 
the the best and comparing yourself to all these great people you've got to be able to stand out which yeah. is in when you're doing one to one you just have to be the best in your gym yeah totally yeah so going back onto fat loss methods just to close out the show we've done a little bit of a tradition in the last few weeks of picking your favorite hypertrophy methods and picking your favorite um strength methods now they're more specific and more nuanced but let's say you take a beginner client wants to lose body fat. So this could be a more, uh, fat loss approach or it could be a beginner approach. But what kind of training modalities would you tend to use for someone like that? And why? So first of all, I love to keep it simple when it comes to fat loss. And um, I'll always start, not always, I will usually start with a German body composition style and then progress that going forward. For those who don't know what German body composition is, it's supersetting upper body and lower body. Most yeah. personal trainers that follow Charles Poliquin probably have just done that almost entirely with their clients. But if you're not sure, that's what it is. Full body workouts three times a week, normally three times a week. Yeah, so I'll run that. Um, you know, you know, you get, you know, you do a leg work, you do a leg exercise, blood goes to the legs. You do an upper body exercise, blood goes to the upper. You create a blood pooling effect. The output is just way, way harder. And it's a nice way to um, address techniques, um, not push too much lower body or upper body volume um, over the week. And um, it allows you to play with lots of different exercise um, variations over the week as well. And then, so I might say we do a squat and then we do a pull. And then in phase two, we may just tweak the GBC and then superset the same muscle group. So we may do a squat and then we may do a leg curl, and then we may do a bench press, then we may do a pull, something like that. I may progress that GBC that way. Would you look at sometimes maybe going even into a heavy light? The next progression could be agonist agonist supersets, right? So you go into a squat yeah. into, let's say, a leg extension. Um, yeah. And that, I know that um, Mark Cowell uses that quite a lot, especially with his female clients. Um, and that's that's something that... I think if you've got someone that can handle a little bit of intensity and then it doesn't go on, could affect the squat too much, or if you've got access to stable machines, like doing a pendulum squat into a leg extension, that could also be a particularly good um, way of progressing a GBC workout yeah, and increasing hard. density. Very yeah, very yeah. hard. Mm. Yeah, very hard. Why, so we, with, uh, with GBC, you mentioned because of the output being higher, and you, would you generally keep the GBC sort of framework throughout someone's training until you move them into a a different goal that might suit a different training split? Yeah, I generally would, yeah. Um, I like to have my GBC. I like to do like a lower body push day and an upper body pull day and then mm. change it to a lower so body. So a cross body. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I like to, that's the method I like to use for my like sort of frequency, etc. I think mm. it works really well. I, I, I like that. If I've got an online client where the days, the amount of times you want to train in the week doesn't really matter, like I can play around with it. I will tend to start three times full body and then use the other days, as I said before, do some steady state cardio, build a big aerobic base with that. And then as I start to get, but it's about seven, six to eight weeks, right? Where you sort of kind of get a, if you do hard aerobic work, you're going to max out your aerobic capabilities, right? Yeah. So once I'm starting to get into that phase, I'm moving to a phase two, I might then add a training day and do like a cross body split like that. Or if they want to train, say do three days a week, I may do, um, two full bodies and an upper or something like that um, to, to focus on what the guys want. Um, and then, yeah. And I, I, in my final phase, if I'm working with a general population client and then we look at, they just want a really good photo. I will probably, I, if I'm, if there's no deadline, I don't do this. I like, I quite like a balanced approach, but I might go full bodies for phase one and phase two. And if I do a phase three, it'll be like, one big lower body lift at the start of the workout and everything else is upper focus. So there's a lot of volume on the muscles that are going to show um, yeah. for, for the end goal or for their photo. Um, that's sort of how I would probably program it, but it, it totally varies. I like to have an optional day in there for people as well to um, have a play, you know, with what they want as well. Um, take a bunch of exercises or if they're in a new gym, just have a play with the machines, get confident. Um, just have a mess about or alternatively go and do a, a group class or train with a friend or something as well you know just like to that. keep that sort of um yeah it's good for the mind good for the brain you know i think doing something like that and also as well if you've got people that really really love we talk about this volume stuff and if they can't recover from it if you've got someone that really likes that 
going and doing a class that probably isn't going to actually tax their muscular system in the same way. It keeps a bit of that in their life so you get less bite back by giving them what they need because they're going somewhere else to get a little bit of what they want. They're just managing it with what else you're doing in there, right? It's a good, yeah, and it's a good education day for them as well because um, they realise that they can't train hard without me <laughs> and they realise, oh, my shoulder's hurting again. I told you not to do the boxing, that's why. Um, so it's a good education tool for them, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, and no, I, 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 I quite like, I quite like that approach with exercise selection. Do you tend to start with a bigger pool of exercises so they can kind of get good at a variety of movement patterns, and then bring that pool down and become more specialist as you start to find weak points and lifts they want to work on and things like this? Yeah, I tend to, I tend to think so, but it does also depend on their level of skill. Um, You'll find some people have a very poor level of skill and they struggle to, um, you know, string different exercises and pull them together. So I might just keep it more simple and have only a few exercises that we work with. And then I would use more machine based um, exercises with those people. Mm. Um, you know, for example, I have someone who has um, the beginning stages of Parkinson's. So, you know, my approach with him has to be a little bit different to someone else his age um we i train him three days a week and we do a uh, step up but we do different variations of it but we don't manipulate anything else we may do a dumbbell step up a goblet step up and then maybe a um you know like a, a banded step up where we hold onto the bands the height stays the same we just manipulate the implement that we're using mm -hmm. um so that the brain doesn't have to get too complex with it and it sounds simple but um, from a skill perspective, his brain is deteriorating. So something as simple as that works very well. Mm, I like that. I, I think even with people that don't have something as, as horrible as Parkinson's, it just having like, okay, how do we, what are the patterns that we want to work? I want more variety in, I want to go through as, as big a wide variety of movements as I can, but how can I create similarity? within those movement patterns. So for sake of argument, I generally, when I work with clients, I'm building a GBC. We have an A1, A2, B1, B2, and then target areas, right? So I have eight foundational exercises that I'll give to most beginners, right? These are my, I, I pick one from each of them, and that's my A's and B series sorted. So you've got a vertical push, vertical pull, horizontal push, horizontal pull, unilateral squat, bilateral squat, hip extension, knee flexion. Knee flexion being by far the most neglected. Like I see people put like leg curls in C series and things like this. Like, prioritize your blooming leg curls. They are so important for hip stability. They are so important for knee stability. It's crazy. Yet people tag them on, like they tag on a lateral raise or a calf raise. Like, do your hamstring work. Just you crying out loud. But like, that's those are my eight movement patterns, right? So I pick one from each of them. And then what I would do in my target areas would be based around what do they want to preference? Like, I want the biggest arms in the world. Then I've got to do some arm work. What their, what their smaller muscle groups are. I always think you're only as big as your smallest muscle group. If you look at a picture of my back when I'm lean, my back is much more developed than my triceps. My triceps make my back look smaller. My back does not make my triceps look bigger. Mm. So the focus has to be on them. And then what's going to help me in future phases not give me a headache? So what are the, like, this, the this individual bricks that help me build the squat house? Yeah. That could be a leg extension. That could be a power raise. That could be bracing work. And I, if, I would probably have within those target areas some form of anti-extension and anti-rotation exercise so I can teach yeah. people to brace effectively, right? Now, within those fir first eight that I was talking about, very similar to you, I was like, right, even though we've got eight different patterns, how can we create some level of um, similarity in those things? So if I'm going to do a dumbbell press my horizontal press, I'm not going to do the barbell for the vertical. I'm going to keep it dumbbell press each time. So there's a dumbbell press in every workout. It may be a different angle, but the, the, the skill that they have to learn is the same. Yeah. You know, so. Um, uh, yeah, I like that. I like that. One thing I really liked, and I remember I got this from you, and it, it, it doesn't work in busy gyms, but it worked at the, the, the busyness that we had at the time when we worked together. I love that you did, used to do two full body workouts, and then you used to do a sort of death circuit. And what people don't know what that means, it's like a, a giant set of four compound lifts, the exercise that you wanted to master. So I remember you were like having sort of like barbell hip thrust, incline dumbbell press, prone dumbbell row, um, and let's say a goblet squat. Those, let's say you four exercises out of those eight that you go, these are the ones I really want to focus on. 
and you do them again in that third workout. I really like that if you've got like space to work with. And it's a hard cardiovascular push as well. Yeah, and you can always like make that like a dumbbell complex, you know what I mean? Um, you know, if, if you know, if it's a busy gym, make it a barbell or a dumbbell complex um, mm. if they're advanced enough to do that. Or even a body weight sort of mobility conditioning circuit. You know, they're mm. quite hard, quite different, mm. quite hard. Maybe not for everyone, but maybe someone that likes yoga, um, they might enjoy that. Some of those are generally the hardest, like the generally the hardest work I've ever done in my life was that sort of style. And it was a, it was a work I did with Akash. Shout out to Akash who owns R&T Fitness. And we were coming back after Christmas and he, were, he just comes up to me and goes, sorry, do you want to just do a workout? Like we haven't trained in a few days. It's, you know, we want to get some Christmas weight off. We're just like a little full body, nothing too hard. I'm like, all right, sounds good. So we get to work. We got open our pen and paper. Like, we're making this work on the fly. And it was like, right, we're going to be quick because it's like bank holiday. We just want to get out and spend time with the families. So you pick one lower body push, one upper body pull, one like lower upper body push, one lower body pull. And we put them together. And what we decided on, just to play around with some stuff, because the gym was quite empty because a lot of people were on holiday, we did a um, Nordic curl on the glute ham raise. We did a ring push up. And then we did, and this is the this is the pairing that was a killer. If we did these at different orders, then I think it would have been much easier. It was just how this worked. Single arm row, left arm, Bulgarian split squat, right leg. Single arm row, left arm, Bulgarian split squat, right leg. That peripheral heart action, the blood pool that you were saying, that's hard on its own. But when you're literally going back and forth between two unilateral exercises, it's the most brutal thing I've ever done. We're supposed to do five rounds. We got to the end of the third. I look up at Akash and I'm like, please say no more, please say no more. And I just look at him, he just does this. He just like, and I'm like, thank fuck for that. It was horrible. Yeah, that sounds brutal. brutal. I still use that pairing with clients every now and again. Not as a four, but I, as like a superset sometimes. If I really want to try and just push the conditioning a little bit. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's never disappointed. One method I like to use is, um, I, I got it from my um, lecturer on my master's, Dan Cleetha, is called Grease in the Groove, mm. where you take a specific load and you just do five sets of five with it, but it's a low intensity, so you're learning, you're, you're teaching your body the skill behind the movement, and it just ingrains a good pattern. Now, mm. it's not great for fat loss, but for skill development, it's very, very beneficial. So mm. I sometimes do that with a split squat. I just do five sets of five on each leg um, to start the workout, for example. Do you know what? That would be quite good at as well. Like, you know, um, there was this phase, certainly in the early days of Pollock, and obviously we did it together. We talked about this in terms of in the hypertrophy one, I think we talked about, of the twice a day training, right? And we did the strength in the morning and hypertrophy in the evening. Now, if you want to, if someone has the ability to train, there's a coach watching this and maybe wants to give twice a day training and go, but can't train hard twice a day. Maybe they're busy, maybe they've got a lot on. I bet that's a really good thing. You do a morning workout where it's just greasing the groove. And then you do an evening workout on that same body part. It's like almost like doing a bit of a loaded mobility. You get into good positions and then in the afternoon you reinforce that pattern. I bet that works really well. Yeah, yeah. I did, um, I did a weightlifting session two days ago with a friend, a couple of friends, and their weightlifting coach. And I just had a barbell and 40 kilos. And I was just doing some cleans. Like, it was easy. Didn't even sweat. Didn't even work. But the next day, my body was so sore because I'd done something very different to what I'm used to doing. So everyone has to remember that, you know, you're only as good as your last program, your last workout. But doing new stuff is very, very important and challenging you. Um, your body, your physique, the different energy systems is very important. Mm. Um, you you know, you've got to tap into stuff that you don't like sometimes and don't enjoy doing or ain't exposed to, to reap a nice, healthy benefit. Yeah, I've got a, cl I've got a client who, um, who is, is struggling with some blood work issues, for, um, a few iron level deficiencies, thyroid issues, and just like a general level of inflammation that we're just trying to work out from a few bad coaching experiences. And he's very much a beast mode style training not too much like but he likes training he likes exercises that feel like they're challenging so his symptoms started to go up recently so we just started to pull he didn't want to bring food up anymore so we started to pull training volume um 
down a little bit. So I went through like two big days at the start of the week because he, he found a routine that kind of works for him. And then we just focus on some of the weak points. He's got a few issues with his feet. So we start working on some of the foot stuff and some ankle stuff. Um, and one of his he's saying early on is that I don't really like arm days because I just feel like I'm not getting anything out of it. And he was like, he, he wanted, he was, when he first did the foot stuff, he was a bit like, oh, it feels like a bit of a prehab stuff. It doesn't feel like, I don't feel like I'm really taxed. I'm like, yeah, but define challenge. I, I just like, I want you to reframe the way you think. Rather than everything has to be really beast mode in the gym, define challenge. You, you will not get out of breath doing tibialis anterior raises. Of course you won't. But you can't tell me that tibialis anterior raises aren't hard. There's a very, very, very different kind of hard. They're very local hard rather than systemic hard. And that should now allow you to recover more. This is obviously a different, very extreme case, but this pulling back from that mindset of hard has to mean I'm taxed. Hard can just mean very specific. It can be those small muscle groups and the workout doesn't always have to feel like you've been beasted. Yeah, I agree with that totally. Um, and it's just education, isn't it? And teaching people, um, mm. you know, what they're working towards and, you know, that's mm. it really. So I think we've covered pretty much everything we need to do for uh, fat loss. Well, fat loss, hypertrophy and strength. So we'll, we'll delve into some deeper topics over the next few weeks and mechanic stuff. And we've got a few ideas yeah. in the pipeline. Um, but I don't want to spend too much of your time. You've got to go and enjoy the UK whilst you're still there. And I know you're like heading off, uh, heading off to Dublin. Much. So we haven't said this for a while because you're on every week. But just as a, a while, whilst you're in London and maybe on a different time zone, where can people find you? Um, if anyone's in London, it's, you know, wants to know more about you and even come and train with you. Where can people find you? Yeah, so you can find me, my socials are Stephen Collins Training, website stephencollinstraining.com. Um, chuck me an email, chuck me a message. I'm happy to help anyone if they need coaching or just general advice. Um, I'm in London for the next three and a half weeks, doing a bit of traveling through Europe, but just hit me up on socials. Um, I'm not posting that much at the moment just because I'm, you know, enjoying myself. But yeah, um, make some contact and we can share. Yeah. I'll 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 cut up this into loads and loads of clips so you can just hit the collaborate button and that's your content yeah. sorted for the next few weeks. Yeah, that'd be Bro nice. Yeah. <laughs> no worries, man. I'll get on it. Mate, thanks again. I will speak to you next good week. Time. Have a good time in Dublin. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much for watching the podcast. If you're like me and like to binge watch podcast episodes, click here for our most recent episode. And if you enjoy the show and want to be updated when new videos come live, click here to subscribe to the channel.